And so, so when you speak about general about the scaly curvature, there are two kind of perspectives you may have. And one depends kind of results you prove or the methods you use. And they just leads you in some way dif different directions. So <clears throat> let me remind you what we are what we're talking about, this kind of topological. So where topology and geometry kind of become diver di diverge. So topological and I will call them ne negative, yeah? Negative topological results. And this concern non-existent theorems, so I'll give them manifold and certain topology of that, that it cannot have metric with positive scaly curvature. And, and this was actually up to some point of a starting topics in, 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 this, in, in this matter f from point of view of a geometrist. But on the other hand, there was this guy coming from general relativity. There were positive energy or, or mass. Yeah. It was conjecture, and then it was a theorem. And then there were various variations of that, which were geometric. But they were quite, but they were quite, <coughs> quite special. So, so let uh, me uh, remind what was happening here. And so, what is the status of that? So, one, so, so I dis one, one re related to minimal surfaces, which I come to, to later. And this was partly motivated by and, and inspired by physics, I believe, yeah, which I, though I couldn't extract exactly the, this, what was happening in physical literature, though I think many things were already there. But let me describe this topological approach coming from Lustig. And I described how we can prove that on the n-dimensional torus, why it admits no metric with point of scaly curvature. And the logic is as follows. So, so first, you, you study Dirac operator. So again, let me remind you, what is Dirac operator? There is certain bundle, which is spinner bundle over there, where it acts. What essential, this bundle splits like that. So it, it, it is sum of two terms for even dimension. And observe, again, it's an artifact. By the way, I say it, but I hate saying that. If you prove for even dimension, you automatically prove for odd dimension. Because right? Because if you have torus of dimension 2n plus 1, you multiply it by one dimensional torus. If this has positive curvature, this has positive curvature. You reduce odd dimensional case to even dimensional, but this kind of morally wrong, of course. Yeah, you, you shouldn't. You shouldn't do that, right? Yeah. And in fact, if you do it correctly, you, you don't have to distinguish dimensions. Well, but anyway, so yeah, it's even dimensional. So the, the splitting, so this spinner bundle splits into plus and minus. And the, the operator exchanges pass. Because as it stands, the, the, the full operator self are joined. So its index is 0. But because it consists you know, of these two parts, they mutually, indices mutually cancel. But each of them has non-zero index. And usually, the one restricted to here, we call it b plus. And that's essential, because the rest of man manipulation with zero operator which you produce new elliptic operator, which is self-adjoint, but doesn't split, which index 0, but still can be used for certain purposes, as was, I think, first observed by Minou in, for, in, 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 for, for the rigidity of complex, for real hyperbolic spaces, for complexes still unknown, I guess. OK, so that's the point. So if this operator, whatever it is, you know by the index theorem, which is kind of give you a simple, kind of verifiable criterion of vanishing or unvanishing this index, then uh, you know that there are this harmonic spinners, meaning kernel of that. But the way when people speak about the history of the, uh, of the index theorem, they, of course, it was proven by I think in, 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 70, in 63, and it was at least announced, and then the proof were appearing in various generality. Prior to that, several years before, question was raised by Gelfand, who uh, uh, observing that index of uh, elliptic operators, Fred Holm operators in particular, 
in general, invariant under deformation, under homotopies. And therefore, there is a question of what it is that index. And nowadays, it's just one line kind of argument. This you had denoted that. However, it, interestingly enough, there is a paper by Alexandrov when he proved his famous, give one of the two proofs of this alexander fenchel inequality, or basic inequality in convexity. And it's about 50 pages paper. In 49 pages, he proves a certain index invariant. Some particular elliptic operator, he proved the index invariant under homotopies. Right, so it was a, and I don't know if it was kind of, the first paper when I've seen it was certainly in, in 30s or something, 35. And uh, so it is a really kind of simple but a fundamental fact. And then making formula, you can say, well, it's just trivial. You just look at sufficiently many examples when you can compute it and then deform it. And so in, in this way, it was done by some people in Russia, just be, um, maybe slightly before Atsisinka, but they made mistake. They, they lost some factorial coefficients. So the formula was wrong. So of course, there are some tricky. The, the formula which involved algebraic formula involved kind of funny numbers involved, which are not so easy to justify, kind of a priori. And, but anyway, you know, maybe zero, non-zero. But for torus, OK, everything is zero. It's parallelizable. There is no kind of so index should be zero. On the other hand, you do know that torus do have harmonic spinners, namely a parallel one, right? But so what? But they certainly have a zero index. But if you deform the torus, these parallel spinners disappear. But the new spinners appear. But now we are not parallel for the flat structure. But you consider twisting it with a linear bundle over the torus. You, have, you, just, you, have, you take coefficient of the spinners with linear bundle, which is flat, but not uh, have zero connection, but non-trivial which corresponds to non-trivial characters of the fundamental group. And so yes, when you start deforming it, it does not disappear, it just shifts. And there is a more, more general theorem for family saying, yeah, it's there. So in, in some generalized sense, index is non-zero, but you have to understand in the family. And in the family, the, it takes values, not in numbers, but you have this parameter space of all these line bundles or the two interlay bundles. It happens to be, again, a torus, a kind of a dual torus, torus of characters of the fundamental group. So now, for every moment, for, for every position, you have this elliptic operator. It has kernel and co-kernel, take their difference. And so you have difference of two bundles. So you, if you think about the virtual bundle of a torus, which you have to make little effort to make sense of this, because variable. It's element of K-theory. It's characteristic pluses define your index. And the, you know, it's, for this example, you can compute again. Also, for families, it's kind of exercise in analysis to show index is invariant. This K-theoretic element, when you deform this metric with the manifold, this uh, vector bundle kind of changes, but only by homotopy. And therefore, it's representative K-theory doesn't change. And so here you can compute it explicitly. You, you don't have to know index theorem for that, yeah? And then it, it follows that torus doesn't have metric or positive scalar curvature. Right? And then this is a kind of, kind, of, kind of elementary argument. But if you a little bit go the st next step, then you see more. If you, instead of this torus, you take manifold of dimension n and map here, and degree of the map is non zero, then by index theorem, still, you have Dirac and everything provided this manifold is spin. And this is a very annoying condition because we don't, we, it's, you, 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 you can't exclude it in this context. And so you, in this way, you prove that even if it's not a torus but had a rather complicated manifold but spin, then it has no metric of positive scalar curvature. But you make, for example, in dimension four, if you just take connected sum of this, this CP2. Then you don't know, because it's not spin, you cannot, CP2 is, I keep forgetting, CP2 is non spin, yeah. It's just one by one, yeah. And so you cannot tell, cannot tell by this method if it has metric of, or not of, of positive, uh, of, of positive curvature. However, a, a posteriori, or actually a priori, it was proven this dimension, but it's OK. It doesn't have this metric. And it's extremely unclear what is the role of the spin in, in here, yeah. 
And then from that, the, kind of the next level of generalization, you can go in two directions. I don't know, maybe I give you another. Uh, there is another argument. Now I want to give another argument where you be which carry a little bit geometry because this is absolutely non geometric because it depends on this very special algebraic property of the fundamental group. It has this representations. There are flat bundles. So it's a very special property. Imagine you have a manifold which the, the fundamental group has no uh, fine dimensional representations at all. Yeah, which such things abundant. And, but then you can proceed in, in a different way, in a more geometric way, and which leads you in, in a, somewhere else. As follows. You go to the Euclidean space, which covers. No, maybe tem temporarily, I, I don't do that here, just to make it simpler. I, 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 instead of torus, I take the high order covering of this torus. So that these torus become very, very big. We're getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and kind of in the limit you have kind of Euclidean space. But so everywhere locally it looks like this Euclidean space on the certain scale. But and now in, on the Euclidean space, what you do? You can see the bundle, which is flat and infinity, and so supported some way here. And again, assuming dimension, dimension is even because it's, because it's, 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 it's zero over there. You can think it's, it's coming from the sphere. And here on the sphere, it has non-trivial churn class, top dimensional churn class, even dimension. Like for example, if in dimension two, if it were in dimension two, it's certainly quite easy case. So just take pull back with some bundle of a still like whole bundle, which is optimal in this situation. Now, and then you just in, in, in do this on the torus, so to have closed manifold. Again, pure technicality, but essential. When you see in, in a while, it's kind of not pure technicality when you look further. But it's at this stage a minor issue. So you, you produced a bundle over the torus. But now, because it's over Euclidean space, you can stretch it, yeah? It's Euclidean, you can scale it. And so this bundle becomes, this picture becomes like that. So the bundle becomes, when you sketch it, sketch it, sketch it, it has the same churn class, but it, its geometry becomes asymptotically flat. When you spread it, it becomes indistinguishable from flat. Of course, to implement on the torus, you have to go to high and high, high covering, and then become eventually flat. And if you twist your zero cooperative with this bundle, it will not notice it was non-flat locally, because because it's almost flat, just arbitrary small error. And this error becomes smaller than scalar curvature there if you assume it was positive. Now assume scalar curvature was positive. You assume this error much smaller than scalar curvature. Scalar curvature was it remained because I just took covering of the torus. I didn't change scalar curvature. It was normalized to be everywhere at least plus one. On the other hand, the, the bundle becomes epsilon flat everywhere. And the, in this basic formula, the Dirac squared equals this positive operator squared plus one quarter of scalar curvature plus a return coming from the bundle, call this bundle L. It's curvature bundle. This term becomes epsilon. This goes to zero. You don't have to know where it is. Bundle just disappears, becomes zero. So you can forget it. And still you apply this formula. It's still positive. There is no spinners. But of course, topologically, nothing changed. It's just my perspective has changed. So spinners must be there. So observe this, two, this is another proof so saying there is no thing on the torus. I observe it's a different proof because you use completely different spinners in the universal covering. In the first case, the, the spinners, if you leave them from this flat torus, they were just trivial bundle. Right? When you take this line bundle, which was flat, when you look at upstairs, it becomes a trivial bundle. So you prove, and this, and this kind of the spinners were kind of spreading like that. And here they are quite different, yeah? These are non different spinners. And you know, if you see what's happening upstairs, they're different. So if, I think there are three, four, five proofs like that. So by index theorem, you prove that there are spinners of a certain kind, and then you show they cannot be there if the scalar curvature is positive. And now you can uh, go in two, in two directions. And so what you can prove with that in general. And so one, as I was saying, 
create with sister algebras. And so what you do, and this was became dominant in, in, um, because it's related to Novikov conjecture. And uh, so you can see the infinite dimensional flat bundles. You can see the infinite dimensional representation of your fundamental group doing the re like regular representation. You're already inside of this. It may harbor a lot of kind of non-trivial non non spinners. So if you consider this kind of bundles over your manifold and takes again, and the point is, if you do it correctly, so these concepts of a family of bundles being substituted by family of sister algebra, we should think as a family is kind of this fixture space, non-commutative space corresponding to this non-commutative algebra. Sometimes you can show index again non-zero. And so there is a big conjecture saying that for all groups, properly defined index is non-zero. Therefore, you can have metric of positive scalar curvature. However, when you start to specifically verify it, it boils down to usually always to the same condition. At least there is no counter example for all and all. And so it's, it's, and so, so it's possible, which I've tried to justify, that all this activity, both in, 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 in for positive scale equation, you know, it's kind of fixtures. If you look whatever the proof, it's more or less obvious from different perspective, right? Maybe, but just again, it depends on conjectures, but in some, in some cases it is so. Because, because of the following thing. So let me give kind of specific argument and understand how it works. Because the Novikov conjecture, so, so next case after, after Lustig, who proved it. So again, so what Lustig proved is that if you have this n-dimensional torus and take any manifold and map it here, and then they take pullback of this point, assuming this was n plus 4k. So I have this generic point, take it pull back. It's sitting here. And uh, this is a 4k dimensional manifold. It has a signature, and the signature is homotopy invariant of this manifold. If you, if you take another smooth structure and have the same homotopy class of maps, this doesn't change. And this is kind of uh, was, uh, Novikov conjecture, the provides called higher signatures. And if this were simply connected manifold, this you can do the same. And then this pullback, you know, it's never true, right? If it is so simply connect manifold, take pullback of the point, you can, when you change structure, you take essentially any values. Uh, well, just divisible by something, right? This, this, no, the full flexibility of this invariance. And this is a, a corollary of the Novikov Browder theory, which is quite, quite simple. But the way it's really very simple, because I was giving lectures. On, on manifolds uh, in uh, some point grade symposium, uh, improving where you think, uh, you, you prove almost from zero everything in one hour, including this. But two things you cannot prove. Two things are non-trivial. It's first one point grade duality, and secondly, third theorem of finite and homotopy groups. Granted that all the rest of topology, called tautology, is tautological. You just don't have to think. It's that, 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 with some little, using some idea of point grade. Which is, you know, because if usually homological algebra, homology theory, it takes several pages to, to do. But if you use the language adopted by Poincare, it becomes tautology. But it, uh, and then at some moment, people, at, at some time, I believe, I'm not studying, of course, carefully, maybe Poincare, people thought it's unrigorous. But it was just because language was kind of not, 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 not uh, 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 proper language was not there at that moment. And the right concept, well, okay, it is. Uh, the issue. So, so I won't say it's very elementary. Brown knowing of theory is just kind of trivial stuff. And anyway, once you know it, of course, it's trivial. And here, we still, because we still don't know the answer, it's, it's non-trivial. And so the conjecture, knowing of conjecture, particular instance of which is unknown, if it is true, if here we have arbitrary a spherical manifold, which is meaning universal covering is contractible. And but this conjecture can show kind of fundamental class, and it's. Uh, but in the same you can formulate for any cohomology class inside. And then there's no of conjecture. And then it's b if you look carefully, it has nothing to do with, it can be reformulated purely algebraically. It's some property of the fundamental group which makes sense for any fundamental group. And in particular, in this particular instance, it says something of the following kind. So we just say, just, I just formulate another shape of this conjecture. So given a group, 
say, kind of it's corollary of the conjecture, but it is essentially as, as uh, kind of difficult, as unapproachable as the general case. So given a group, you, you can form the, I think, say, say a real, yeah, a ring of this group. Maybe complex better, yeah. And then there is also conjugation, right? You can make conjugate and re replace gamma element by, by its reverse. So it's a group, ri a group ring is, is conjugation. So, and then you think about this the ring and consider the width group over this ring. So it's like a, instead of quadratic forms, you have to, might be Hermitian forms uh, or, or, or on many variables. And you, there is usual rule, so, so if A, uh, so read the, the sum, yeah. You can sum them, and if, and if the group can be diag diagonalized without middle terms, it's considered trivial, right? It's kind of definition of weird group. And, uh, and so, so this is a kind of weird group. And the point is, it's never trivial. So if, if, if this say, if the group has homology in dimension 4K, non-trivial rational homology in, in, in the dimension 4K, this group is non-zero. And that's the point that has nothing to do with manifolds. And it's quite difficult in, in a specific example. Say that again. You're saying that if your statement, pi, so you assume pi is a, some non trivial homology, what, what's the conclusion? So again, if there is a group, and the group has non trivial homology in dimension for k, then if you take the V to group over its group ring, right, you can see it's group ring, but it's like careful, there must have an evolution of that, some extra structure. So you can see the Hermitian, you can speak about Hermitian form, not just quadratic, but Hermitian. And you can see the V group. So it is a, you can see the quadratic form over that, and the summation you just add, add one to another, and there is a conception of a trivial, of a trivial one. And trivial one is just a, 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 some subject like a squared minus b squared. Like, but the tricky point is, in other identification, when you change coordinates, and then the, in, and because you right, you, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a in a ring, like an, always in some base like that, and in another base it's another. You have to bring it to this shape in some change of coordinates. And this change of coordinates for non commutative cases is a whole mess. That's the easy part. But who knows, I write you this quadratic form. How you can check that the reason that some change of coordinates become trivial? And uh, essentially, all arguments use index theorem, so implicitly or explicitly. You reduce it to something which you can get visualized. But if you look closely from certain perspective, I'll, I'll show you, it becomes geometric property. And this geometric property can be proven, I guess, in this case, by just uh, by very elementary means, essentially kind of simplified version of the original proof of Novikov topological invariance. Right? And for, for scaly curvature, it's most transparent. So this I shall uh, want to explain to you. These things are parallel. They diverge at some point, but so far, I think the two ma subject matters are very much close to another. So, so what you do is scaly curvature. So again, so there was this historic, and it's in, interesting that the first, first book, was, of course, other people. First there was Novikov, then there was Lustig, and then there was paper by Mischinka. And, uh, and, uh, and the Mischinka proven that if you have manifold of, of non-positive curvature, Then its fundamental group satisfies Novikov conjecture. So, in, in particular, if it were closed manifold and you map another manifold, take pullback of the point, etc., the signature would be invariant. But it, he proved for all homology. And there is some little difference between fundamental class and non fundamental class. So, in, in how you prove the corresponding statement in the scaly curvature, which in scaly curvature, some of the statements are actually easier to prove. But, but if you look closer, they because more or less become virtually the same. So if you have many, so we only just now show, we have a manifold which has metric of non-positive curvature, the simplest version of that. And I want to show it's impossible to construct metric with positive scary curvature. So they are, are they mutually incompatible. Now the argument, the argument we had with, with Lucic doesn't work because you know nothing about this fundamental group. You don't know there are any non-trivial representation of this at all. Though, a posteriori, you know, there are this infinite dimensional representation, a regular representation, carries in our structure. But let's do it more, more kind of geometrically. But what you do know, that 
if you go to the universal covering, and you still can put this kind of a bundle, and because you know that this hyperbolic space, universal covering of this manifold, admits a map to the Euclidean space is one dimension n, is dimension n which, can, which goes kind of by homeomorphism, but essentially by the, its proper map of degree 1, and it contracts as much as you want. Therefore, if you take this kind of a bundle of Euclidean space, non-trivial, again, assume dimension even, take a bundle localized infinity, non-trivial chain class, and make this map very much contracting, right? It's an inverse exponential map, of course, for negative curvature, but uh, any, any map of this type will do. And pull back this bundle, so you create, now in this universal covering, you create a, a bundle which, if you twist Dirac operator with this bundle, you would make non-zero, it would have non-zero index, you would have harmonic spinners, but this harmonic spinners a priori will leave on this space, not on this space, on the universal covering, which is minor point. Again, it's, it's, it's some technical point which we can resolve, and in C still index theorem works in, in this context, though many fall non-compact, you might be careful. But if the group were easily finite, if you could fi construct finite coverings here, which kind of un unravel this manifold, of course, it can transplant it back here and use usual index theorem. But you can also do that. And so the, the, the point is here you use bundle which nearly flat and un un unlike flat, and the proof works pretty well. And again, it seems to me you have index theorem. But, but then, uh, how we can recapture it with minimal surfaces? So the point I'm saying that, in fact, with minimal surfaces, you can prove better statements as far as Kelly curvature is concerned. And I, I think if you properly transform minimal surfaces to, 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 to this language, for example, the correspondence, correspondence here would be this was what the Shen, Shen Yao proof they exactly followed the logic of the Novikov proof. They just make geometric, okay, there is some analysis there, but the logic of the proof essentially, well, parallel to the Novikov. And um, if you kind of go b backwards, it's just what I'm going to say, you have translation again back to topology. And the, the, the point is that by using minimal surface, in, in, in a second I explain how it works, what you can prove that if you have any manifold with boundary, And you know its scaly curvature is greater than, say, than 1. The manifold cannot be too large. Cannot be too large means you cannot map it. There is no map to the sphere of uh, n dimensional such as boundary goes to one point, and the map have non-zero degree, and simultaneously contracting, strongly contracting. Right? So it cannot spread in all directions too much. And then, of course, you know, because this exactly, if it has this negative curvature, it does spread a lot. If you change metric, you only change by finite amount. So this implies that. And so I'm using, po I'm using point because we have this paper with Blaine Lawson about, you know, in, 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 in 83, so it's quite a while ago. Can you say the assumptions on the map to SN, you want them to have? The, the map to SN, so the boundary to this manifold called also X, boundary goes to one point x goes to Sn, map has non-zero degree, and so for example, its Lipschitz constant is less than 1 of n, I know. And actually, uh, the, the, for the moment, you know almost sharp constant, right? Up to co co one half. You must be careful, so it's better to say scalar curvature greater than n, n minus 1. Right? So it's the same scalar curvature here. And then actually, you can make it with one half, I say. You cannot have such a map. And then, of course, everything follows. But what's amusing, I just realized that actually last night, I mean, in, in, in our paper with Blaine, we have different methods on two different pages, just two pages apart. We give version of this argument and this argument, and we just notice one implies another. It's kind of funny. Yeah? Because we use different scaling. Some way it was big number here, small number here, and so pictures were quite different, mental pictures. And but in, interesting enough, this uh, and, and I realized only l last night when I was exactly trying to explain similarity in, uh, between the two results, and I realized one imply another. So my and so let me explain slightly more general kind of statement, which is more interesting 
and which is more general and which is more relevant to dynamical conjecture. And this will be as follows. When actually you need slightly kind of more subtle version of all of that. And it is as follows. So now today I want to make a break. Last time I didn't make a break and it was kind of too tiring to everybody. So, so what I want to now, I want to prove. So yes, I, yeah, I just want consider a rather simple case. So here there will be manifold of negative curvature compact of these dimensions, background manifold. And this will be n-dimensional manifold closed, and there is a map. And here is picture, this is bigger. So. And we assume the map is not homologous to 0. So the image fundamental, so it's orientable manifold. This you don't have to say it. And so when I take the image of the fundamental class in here, so it will be Hn of this manifold, it is non zero. Okay. Then this manifold has no metric of positive scalar curvature. So I want to put it into the setting. Kind of there are so what I want to show from this data, again, we use it to geometric situation. And this is, by the way, this, this was context where it was proven by, 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 by mission canonical of conjecture exactly in this setting. And what I'm construction is kind of geometric extract what was done there. Because there it was again on the language of bundles, Fred Holm. So you have no geometric assumption on the, on the target? No, no, this is a manifold. I'm sorry, you didn't say it. It's again, section curvature, non-positive. I, I will make in the, in the course of the argument, I make some simplifying assumptions to just make it clearer. So what happens? But this is essential, it's again. But the point is now it's not going to the top dimension, it goes inside. And there is no some manifold of negative curvature inside. However, the same would work. So what you want to derive from that, So what you want to conclude is that there is sequence of, now make some assumption here. And the assumption just to simplify it, because otherwise, again, you have to go to non-compact space, and you have to develop terminology. It's not that you have to produce very something radically new. I assume that this group is easily finite. So I assume that this manifold has coverings, which kind of such that uh, the inside, they have bigger and bigger balls, yeah, which, which is more or less standard balls. And then, using that, I take a corresponding cover and I assume that this mapping being just embedded. It's just embedded there. And so, so I have this manifold, and here is this embedding, and it's non homologous to zero. So there is complementary kind of by a Poincare duality, another manifold in, 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 has non zero intersection index with that. So we have this manifold. lift of my manifold, and then this, the one which intersected, and I take this product. So I, I look at discovering, and they also have my lift of my manifold and lift of another manifold. And what I am claiming is that I take high and high order covering, and I want to map it to the sphere, and now I want to uh, use the following kind of normalization. So it's, it's convenient to do, to do this way. So it will be sphere of dimension this. Hmm? So X, XI orthogonal is what? This is just manifold which has non-zero intersection index with that of complementary dimension, kind of Popeye Poincare duality. And their product is mapped to the sphere, and this is of this manifold, which has non-zero degree at point number one, and such that along these fibers, its distance is contracting. And, and no assumption along this direction, but on each of them, that, uh, that it, it's Riemannian metric with respect to this Riemannian metric induced from, from here, it's contracting. And so it is, it's kind of, kind of again, it's uh, at least a little technical point how you do that. So you, you have this manifold downstairs, and you go into discovering, they lift upstairs. And so 
you, you, you restrict it to every ball, and every ball you just you collapse all this ball to the sphere. And then you move second parameter. And because they have non-zero intersection index, this degree will be exactly this intersection index. It's kind of elementary topology. There is some little cheating I'm making here, because I, I, what I sec secretly assume that restriction of the tangent bundle of ambient big manifold of this one, when it is restricted to this perp, is trivial. So all the spheres, all tension space, I can ident identify them. It is not true, but it's minor error. It's again, just identification, it reduces error, negligible error. It disappears when the ball becomes bigger and bigger. And so this is the picture. And this is a kind of essential property of manifolds. Here I used universal covering. I, I, I use finite covering. But if if they're not residually finite, I, I, here it will be universal. It will be not universal. It will be covering, induced by universal covering of this. Right. And then I have this map with these properties. And then the point is, when I'm concerned with scaling curvature, I always can assume that this may matter here as big as I want. I just scale it hugely, because I multiply scaling curvature as. When I scale it, this whatever it was with this, the scaling curvature goes to 0. So I have, again, many for the same scaling curvature as this, mapped to the sphere by contracting map. If n is even, I take here a bundle with non-zero non churn class, pull it back, and apply index theorem. And if it were non-compact, you need some non-compact version of the index theorem, which is, again, technicality, which is not quite, as I say, explain. It's technicality, but we look closer. You must be careful. Sometimes it's true, sometimes it's not. But here is fine. And then with the index theorem, you do it. And now, how you can do it with minimal surfaces? So again, what is the fundamental feature which is involved here? It is, I have a manifold x such that if I take it to universal covering and multiply it by something else now called another manifold, which is whatever dimension, this was n, this will be m, then this new one admits a map to the sphere of dimension n plus m such that infinity, this is universal covering, goes to one point, maybe, maybe a, and uh, it's, con, it's con, a here sphere of radius r. The map is along these fibers, it's contracting, and r goes to infinity. So no matter how big r, I can construct such a map. And then this has numerical point of scalar curvature by either using Pull, making pullback of some bundle implying the index theorem, or using minimal surfaces, which I, I start now to, I want now to explain. Can I please repeat that? Hmm? Can I please repeat that? OK, so I have a manifold, which is a, this is a covering of a compact manifold. But this, is in, in fact, yeah, will be not, very little of this will be used, essentially, of a comp com compact manifold. And then I know that for some Riemannian metric, and then the answer doesn't depend on this metric, I can multiply it by some parameter space in another manifold. Map actually doesn't have to be a manifold. Yeah. In, 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 in one can actually can be just pseudo manifold, right? It's just a parameter space. I'm, I, it, it goes to the sphere with non zero degree, such that R can be made as large as you want. And along these fibers, for any, fi for, for, for any, for any fixed metric, it becomes distant decreasing. Of course, it, you fix the metric, and then you choose r. But this doesn't depend which metric you choose, yeah, because it's decreasing as much as you want. So all, all any two metrics differ by a constant. And if you apply it, if it happened to have positive scalar curvature, you run into contradiction. Because this, you imagine, manifold, you make it huge. So on this manifold, you construct this, assuming this number is even you always can make it even because this M and you under your control, you can add line, a circle, whatever. Take pull back on this product of, of this non-trivial bundle, which is as flat as you want, but still having non-trivial non-trivial non churn class because spread a lot because this manifold kind of uh, I, this may be just contracting yeah, because this R goes to infinity. You don't have to say this contraction here. Yeah. If R is fixed, you have contraction. So because very big, this bundle over the sphere is almost flat, right? You take so you stand at any vector bundle on the sphere and, and makes space bigger. The same bundle now from position with sphere become uh, essentially flat. So it's almost flat here. And so uh, uh, locally, Dirac operator look as if 
it was a twist, a twist with band look is untwisted, so uh, on one hand, by index theorem, you must have harmonic spins. On the other hand, the Lichnerovich uh, Bochner formula, whatever Schrodinger says, uh, then or then. So, and so this is a, all my understanding. It's, it is true in the following sense. I can give you instances of theorems when you can prove it with using vector bundles, I give you in, in a second, in this index theorem, when it's, uh, this thing is invisible, it's not there. However, if you look at any concrete example, it is there. So, but that reason I'm saying, but people have the abstract theorems that I give in, in all that of under such, such condition, you have no conjecture. And this formula is very general. However, if you look at any example, much stronger conditions is fine. So you cannot find any example when all this big theorem wouldn't follow from very, very, very easy one. Right? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Let me give an example. Where I don't know, kind of. If I can make specific example, when this will not be covered by this scheme. But this is a, you see, this is kind of very amusing property. So if this x tilde is universal covering of a manifold x with some fundamental group gamma, then this is essentially property of the group. You can formulate some property of the group. And it's very hard to, to, to kind of to, to relate it to other properties. And the example which I want to, to say is, is like that. If you have a a, a, a manifold such that it, it has a two-dimensional cohomology class, is a manifold with dimension to m, such that this class h to the power m equals the fundamental class. We multiple fundamental class. Yeah. So it's a kind of a homologically symplectic manifold. Geometrically, it means that you have a hypersophic uh, manifolds of co-dimension two. M hypersurface, M sub manifold of co-dimension 2 with non-zero intersection index. And such that, condition number one, when you go to the universal covering of this, this element becomes zero. So if you can make a manifold where it has this two-dimensional class, which power of which give you a fundamental class, but in the universal covering it disappears, then uh, you, you, you you can say there is no metric of positive scalar curvature, but everywhere, whenever I use this Yerok operator, manifold must be spin, by the way. So they always must be spin. Yes, manifold downstairs doesn't have to be spin here, but the universal covering must be spin. So, and if it's not, it's not. Yes, absolutely. There is no, no, for the moment, understanding what happened there. On the other hand, when we speak about minimal surfaces, you never notice such spin condition doesn't exist. Of course, with spin, you prove more subtle results. You can kind of, you know, you can, if it is spin, you can prove more. About some, some more, there are more subtle invariants which you can detect, and even more so in dimension four. Which, but, uh, but well, in general, we don't know what. Your example again. So, in order to ensure that you have no uh, political curvature, but what are the assumptions? So, so here again. On the H, what here we have a cohomology class which is here, yes. in such that it's power and equal fundamental class. Yes. It's like symbolic manifold. And then, when, but when you go to the universal covering, this class might become zero. For example, manifold is spherical. It's contractible covering, and all, everything goes to zero. Right. For example, you have four-dimensional manifold, which is a spherical universal covering is, universal covering is, universal covering is contractible, and, and, and uh, it has non-trivial H2 rational H2. Then, of course, by duality square of some class will be non-zero, and it has no metric of positive scalar curvature. Can you indicate how you reduce this case? Yeah, but, I, I, but this case, in this instance, so here the proof is, is based on the fact that you can consider that you, you, the, your, your line, the bundles you use actually be like line bundle, because when you have such a class, there is there is a line bundle which has non-trivial connection. When you go upstairs, they become trivial. But once become trivial, you can take root of this bundle. You can take nth root. And when you take nth root, its curvature goes down. So you take high and high, high root down and become as flat as you want, and you twist with this bundle. And then you have, but you have to, to see that it's, it's work. You need some index theorem, but it's kind of rather elementary. The moment you say it, it becomes rather elementary. But there is no this picture there is no contracting map. It's purely area-wise argument. 
So ge the geometry behind this approach with index theorem is different from the one with minimal surfaces. Even with the proof seemingly identical theorem, on the bottom is something else. However, when you specifically come to compact manifold and you, and you have this property I described, it's possible that still is covering, still admit this map to the sphere which is contracting. Because there is no example, the example which I know, uh, which I can analyze, I like that. And some example you don't know. But so there is no convincing example saying, aha, uh -huh, this condition is satisfied and another is not. Right? And uh, usually in my um, impression, people who work in this domain they, with knowledge of conjecture, they never try to do that. They hate to do that, yeah. And sometimes it happens, they publish a paper, long paper, new condition. And somebody else say, well, it's just trivial, you follow from another condition. Having nothing to do with all this in in the theories. One instance, however, where it seems to me at, at the moment that we're very far from uh, relating this with minimal services, which I shall explain probably after interaction, but I formulate this is the, the following, uh, which, uh, which is uh, related to the Ellen Kohn's, what he calls longitudinal, uh, longitudinal or something, index theorem for foliations. And this theorem says in particular, Yes, if you, or rather the proof of the theorem, as I understood it when I read a long time ago, now I say it by memory because I haven't, you know, it's kind of mathematics, it doesn't stick to my mind too well, but, but the, the, what, it, what it follows is the following kind of a geometric statement, that if I have a manifold X, and such that it admits, it's a non non-compact manifold now, again to Rn, which is, has positive degree, proper and distance, uh, it's Lipschitz, it's a distance decreasing. Then it admits no foliations, such that induced metric has positive scalar curvature. And this is a, yes, absolutely, kind of, it's certainly geometric property. It seems to me this is it's related. It's much stronger than saying that manifold itself has no positive scalar curvature. In positive meaning, scalar greater is something here, you must be uniformly positive. Yeah. It's again, it's, it's b there is big difference you're having between uniformly positive and non-positive, right? You can make this kind of expanding thing like paraboloid is curve, which is positive, but goes to zero, but you, you, but you cannot keep it uniformly positive in, for this shape. And this is a, a rather a significant distinction. And for that, I, my, my answer is this kind of geometric picture doesn't quite fit. It's close to come to that, but you just, I, 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 so, so far I couldn't really make it using minimal surfaces. It may or may not, but this would be extremely interesting. It's absolutely unclear why it should be true. If you think, about even for foliations, when you understand very well, even if you assume kind of leaves compact or something, it's, or I mean compact clauses, if all leaves have compact clauses, it's very unclear what happens. There is some basic uh, issues with uh, understanding geometry of foliations, which is missing. By these techniques, you get it, but you don't know what it signifies, at least from some perspective. So this is, a, uh, this is uh, how it goes. Okay, so let's now make a break, and then after the break, we speak about minimal surfaces. So just <coughs> let me remind first how uh, originally this minimal varieties were used here by Shen Yao. And in some sense, there is also kind of some parallelism. We take this Shen Yao approach. And this untwisted Dirac operator, this gives you topological information, but doesn't give you geometric information. But if you slightly modify this, uh, what they were doing, and uh, then you can get also extract some geometry, right? So when you have flat bundles, it depends on the fundamental group. You don't see the geometry. When you have this uh, almost flat, almost flatness of the bundle, bundles tells you some existence or non-existence of that now become a geometric invariant. And uh, though sometimes you can relate the two. And a similar situation is here. So the logic of the Shanya was quite simple. But it was based on previous work by Kajdan Warner. It's again quite simple, of course, once you do that. So what Kajdan Warner proven is as follows. If you have a compact manifold, with, with some kind of Riemannian matrix G0, and it's suppose that the following operator is positive, it's minus Laplace operator with respect to this metric. 
plus, in, in some something like one quarter, it's slightly less than one quarter. Yeah, but say one quarter, yeah. It will be a slightly different number, depending on dimension, yeah, but it's a, 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 a approximate Kosky-Lee curvature. And, and then this conform will change with the metric, which makes the scale, scale cur curvature positive. So this already, this is, so, so what means this operator is positive? It means if I take any function and take this integral, I'm sorry, d psi squared plus this one quarter n scalar times psi squared, this integral always positive, right? So this term kind of, so it, it means if there is a little bit of negative curvature, it's okay. But in what sense a little bit, it's not so clear, right? And this, by the way, we shall turn, if we have time, I explain what happens for this with Dirac operator. This a little, so how much you allow negative, what kind of negative, is kind of a very kind of delicate point. And one of them is kind of appears as in like Penrose conjecture, when you can precisely say how much negativity you can, you can allow something like negativity. But anyway, if, if it, uh, and so what is the proof? So once you have this operator positive, you take the first eigenfunction of that. And the first eigenfunction of positive operator is positive. And then you multiply your metric by some f to the power, and I keep forgetting what power you have to take. And if you take the right power, and just exactly the one which you get actually when you construct, when you construct, I, d I don't remember if I explained this, Schwarzschild metric. So in, in dimension, <coughs> I think in dimension four, it will be f squared, I guess, yeah. And, <coughs> and, and then you just compute what happens to the metric and the conformal change, and exactly this term jumps up, and when it's positive, there will be some multiple of this function, of some power of the function, and this thing applied there. And this, again, is uh, just one line of computation, which I just don't know how to make it without computing. Of course, uh, you know, if you look at the at examples, it's kind of obvious, and then kind of these principles, right? But the point, it is right. And there is this coefficient, and what essential, this coefficient is less than one half, okay? And that's what essential. And that's, if not, nothing would work. The co that coefficient appears in this operator for all dimension n. In, you know, in Dirac operator, it's one quarter. Here it's even smaller than that. But the correct number is one half for some reason. And so that's a little bit annoying, but then on the other hand, this kind of play on numbers is crucial here. And then, so what you do? So you have a, a Riemannian manifold and take some mini minimal submanifold. And minimal in, in some homology class is locally minimizing, co-dimension one. And assume it's smooth and it's locally minimizing. Because locally minimizing, when you deform it, a long vector field with any y psi is volume goes up. Therefore, certain operator, because it's because it's linearized this equation, you see, become become positive. So I have to compute what the second variation is. And if ambient scalar curvature is positive, this operator is exactly minus Laplace plus one quarter of the scalar curvature of y in the induced metric. And again, you just you write this formula and kind of the point which was missing in earlier papers, my understanding is, of course I have not know what already was in physics literature, but in mathematical literature, this kind of computation in dimension three at least has been done but what was missing is the formula that if you like, if you, that, so a rich curvature in this direction, how it moves exactly control the second variation of, of, of volume, but the rich curvature in this direction, plus all curvatures together in, in this direction, give you scalar curvature of the ambient manifold. So if you subtract the two, you come to scalar curvature of this manifold. So you can express it as scalar curvature of submanifold rather than rich curvature in the ambient manifold. And with rich curvature of ambient manifold, I just in, in, in the in, in, I, I, I posted it. There was an old paper uh, by Buraga, Buraga, and uh, Tapanogov when they do something about three-dimensional manifolds and it was for certain bound on rich equations that it's showing they cannot have two short geodesics. It's much more subtle geometric argument, but this algebra was missing there. Not they didn't need it, and they they meet, but if they realize that, that would have more stronger consequences. Another interesting point historically when people doing these minimal surfaces. They were very much preoccupied, with, even for dimension two, what kind of singularities were there, which is strange because already by the time there was a work by Feder Fleming in, in for, for, for surfaces at least, 
it was quite well understood. However, people kind of in, in dimension two, and originally, I think, also in the Shen Yao paper, they proved themselves existence of minimal surfaces. Instead of referring to the work by Fred Federer, which was done 10 years well, in, in 1970, so 10 years prior to that, there was some kind of, a, kind of uh, much concern with that, yeah, which is justified only partly. But then, by the time already it was known, by 1979, when they wrote their paper, Shen Yao, that up to dimension seven, co dimension one of manifolds, when they're really absolutely minimizing, they're smooth. And this was proven by Federer in, in 1970, based on 68 paper by, by John, Jim Simons. And this Jim Simons is, of course, the most kind of essential ingredient there, right? Because all that is just general compactness, the tie is kind of clear. But again, in Simon, there is a tricky computation about minimal sub-varieties in, in, uh, in spheres with some particular condition, which come from the fact that they're based on a cone, and this cone is minimizing, just stable. And the stability condition transformed to this surface, and it's kind of uh, beyond my understanding, though, funnily enough, I was formally translating this paper to Russian, in Russian. But it was not, I, was, I was not translating, by the way. Yeah? And this is how I learned the subject, because at uh, some point, there was a mathematician, Fett, who was actually a professor of, of, of Toponogov, who had some problem with authorities, because he was, I think, I think it was about the time he was not very happy about the invasion to Czechoslovakia, and he lost his job. And so to survive, he was making translations of, uh, for, for some day, but there he couldn't sign it. And so I was supposed to sign this paper. And so I read a little bit, I understood nothing, but I just remember that, yeah. And this is how I can acquaint it with the subject matter. And I didn't appreciate it at that time that it was a really great paper, except I couldn't, I couldn't understand the paper by Simons. But this really kind of the, in, in this domain is kind of one of the really brilliant papers. And which is, well, significant. We see, I don't, I don't think anybody followed deeply enough along this line, and then what happened, the white dimension seven. Of course, from a certain point of view, it's clear why it fails. This Bambieri juice, which people will say are very happy about that, that not, you know, it breaks in high dimension, but it's kind of obvious. I mean, just from general principles, just routine computation, you do it. It doesn't require, I mean, any, any efforts from, from, from modern perspective, intellectual effort, it's just routine. But this Simon's paper is kind of mysterious, the, the, the y dimension seven, and seven has nothing to do with scaly curvature. Scaly curvature, uh, all phenomena, dimension one, two, three, and then this stabilizes. But anyway, it, it went on. But now, so, so that's the proof. Once you have it, like in the torus, with some metric, you take the cycle, you, you construct another metric of positive scaly curvature, you go down and just to the surfaces. And uh, of course, there is no surfaces. So, uh, and the point is, of course, that the condition which is do it's not being a torus, but ad admitting a map of degree not equal to zero to the torus. This property inherited by hypersurfaces, which are non-homologous to zero, because you can project them to one of the coordinates, non-homologous to zero, some projection also non-homologous to zero. It has positive degree, and so, so the induction works. But uh, I don't remember if I said it, but in fact, the theorem proves something stronger than that. The topological condition is stronger because and, uh, and uh, so the class of manifolds when they rule out positive scalar curvature is not the, the one which cannot be covered, and there is a kind of real theorem due to Schick saying cannot be covered by, by index theoretic techniques. All invariants coming from, uh, there are examples when all invariants vanish coming from uh, Dirac operator, all these indices, generalized indices vanish, but this argument still works. So it's quite, quite, quite uh, simple, logically simple, and this is technicality, what to do in high dimensions. If, so one point, you don't need a spin, which is kind of pleasant. It's kind of maybe not so essential, but still. But, but then, if you, but if still we want to carry the argument in, to go to high dimensions, there are singularities. And this absurd that you have to bother about them. If you look at all formulas, how you prove positivity of this operator, the more, kind of, if it's smooth, but the closer to singularity, the better formula becomes. It's only add, can make operator only more positive. But you cannot use it. You have to find the singularity. In, 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 a couple of years ago, Sean Yao wrote a paper when they exp explain how to go around singularities. But you, you don't 
no, but you don't know actually singularity is truly there because in dimension, ah, this way I can explain now, it's very simple. But in dimension eight, when you have, you know, a singularity is isolated as follows for again from Federer, you know they're unstable. You slightly move your data at the boundary value or something and then become smooth. And this very, kind of, I, 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 I'll, I'll explain in a second, argument is a very simple argument and it looks must work in all dimensions, but so how it doesn't. It's a negligible difference, yeah. So, and if you prove, we could, pro could prove that, and in conceivably there may be a very simple proof because in, in, in this case you don't have to know nothing. So well, you can explain it, you know nothing, just compactness or something. Just, it's from, from, from hand waving. But then this hand waving breaks down in, in higher dimensions. For, for some stupid reason. And then, but still you can bypass it. There are two kind of rules, one by, by Sean Yao, which still that doesn't, you know, it's not as good as on in, in, in other dimensions. And another is due to Lockhamp, Lockhamp, which is, yeah, both prove very complicated. So I haven't read either of them in detail. And I'm more, I'm more inclined to trust Sean Yao because, well, at least I understand intermediate statements. In Loch Campus, yes, you have to understand, not only prove, but statement of about 10 other theorems quite sophisticated about the geometry of minimal varieties. And um, it's very difficult papers. But, so let me be explain how you eliminate singularity in dimension eight. And this related to the following problem, I remember the and uh, uh, undergraduate, so if you have this kind of figures in the plane, yeah, you put them everywhere in the plane, the number of them may be at most countable. You cannot put uncountably many of them. Like intervals, you can put uncountably many intervals, right? Segment, but you cannot put uncountably many y's on the, on the plane. Corollary, in dimension A, singularity unstable. <laughs> Is it clear for you why? No, but you see how you can put, if you put one inside, you always have a space, you always have a space, you always kind of, uh, they don't want to come close, yeah. They just don't want to come close. But that's exactly kind of geometry behind it. And this is the reason, of course, why it should be, should be in, in general, it should be so. Why singularity should be unstable. Because if, if you move it in a continuous family, it's figure Y, this singularity must disappear, right? You have this family of curves, one ins inside of another, right? They all cannot be all singular because you only have countably many of them, but uh, in a continuous family, they're uncountably many. So, and that is uh, the, the geometry, and actually was proven by Nuts and Smale. I haven't read his proof. His proof, I, I look, I just said, uh, he uses too many theorems you don't know, but if you, now, now, now let me explain it from this, from this position. So what is the idea? You, you have the singularity, you have this, what makes it singular is singular cone, right? So if you take minimal variety at some point and scale it, become bigger, 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 bigger. And then from general principles, for follows converges. Uh, and, and moreover, it subconverges to a cone, right? And so you end up with a cone. And if this was flat cone, the point was smooth. If it's singular, it's singular. What is, by the way, still unknown, if this limit is unique. It's in some cases, it's known to be unique, but a priori on the sublimit. And so what you use, why there is sublimit? Because you know that the volume is monotone function. It has tendency to increase faster than a flat case, right? And on that hand, there is compactness. And therefore, if you have monotone function, you know it has tendency to converge. Uh, but it here, it, you don't know to kind of which shape it takes. It may be approximately on here shape, and here it's like a different shape. It may kind of oscillate, yeah. But by the way, one of the problems, I think if you knew uniqueness of the cone, it would be very helpful. And, and actually, Loch can't prove something in this direction. Uh, but he doesn't prove this instability, but he comes very, very close to that. He says that we have, if I understand correctly, because he had vague in his statement, that if you have this minimum of variety, you can a little bit more modify it, become non-singular, but it will be approximately minimal. It will be very, very close, but not totally minimal, not truly minimal. So, 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 but so, so what is this cone when it is, say, isolated point? And they are not flat, so there is a sphere. Inside of sphere, you have some minimal variety, and this cone over the sphere, right? And this cone. But now imagine you move such a family of this 
minimal variety. Start moving them and take these cones. But then you have one cone inside of another cone. But this is exactly what I'm saying. It's important we have some singular thing. It's really going in all directions, yeah? Because this minimal thing is not sitting in one hemisphere. Either minimal thing can be in one hemisphere. So it's spread over the sphere, and it's not being sphere. So you cannot push one cone inside of another, because if you take this minimal variety, you move it a little bit, it intersects itself, right? Because it's kind of, you cannot move it a little bit without intersecting itself. And, and that's rational behind it. But what's the difficulty? Now, let, if you try to make it rigorous, so you go to this limit, so imagine I have family of this minimal thing, one inside of another. And so the theorem is, if you have this family of minimal varieties, one inside of another, then that the number of points where they will be singular will be nowhere close, nowhere dense. It's closed, obviously, you have to prove it's nowhere dense. So, so it cannot be, you can't have the whole interval of them. So you take these cones and then say, huh, now I have moving family of cones. So cones go inside and say, ah, it's impossible. And say, ah, I proved it in all directions, in all dimensions. Right? For, because about cones is true in all dimensions. You can't put cone inside of a cone except in an obvious way. However, there is that subtle point. When you blow it up, so what may happen, you have the singularity, the, the, this cone shifts, yeah, and the cone moves here. The singular point moves along. And you don't have family of cones. But when it happens, it's the only way to happen. This singularity spreads over. And then in some limit situation, you have one dimensional singularity. But you know in the dimension, they cannot be one dimension. And, but this exactly, the sliding, which only kind of uh, makes singularity bigger, does not, does not allow you to make it in higher dimensions. But it's kind of minor thing. I mean, I'm, 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 I just, I, I, I'm pretty certain that, well, that you may have well, one page argument be if you know a little bit more about minimal, minimal varieties. But the argument by, by, by Boslo, Hamish, and Yag is too heavy. And besides, there should be argument without which you only welcome singularity. And they only make the result better. Whenever, whenever you know, whenever you can regularize them, they only improve all inequalities. But now, whatever it is, it doesn't give you again much information about your the manifold. So all you have is some manifold, you know it's Again, this positive, positive, but what you can say about the geometry and how you can extend it to more general geometry. It depends on the topology. You need this exactly this nested family of co-dimensional one objects. So you need you need uh, uh, strong assumption and topology. But what, interestingly enough, if you slightly there are two modifications which you should main introduce to this method. And one is that you allow boundaries. So you have to consider the minimum surface with boundary. And boundaries, th there are two kinds of situations. When you fix the boundary, and when you have free boundary. So you just boundary is somewhere, number one. And number two, you allow, you introduce a weak term. This weak term kind of similar as you, what you twist your, your spin bundle with another vector bundle. So in this direct theorem, there are two. The main term is just this a, 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 a genus, which is come from manifold, from smooth structure of manifolds, kind of subtle and powerful invariant. And then there is something kind of more, more elementary, this churn class, and which relates to geometry. And here is similar to that. What you, the function you consider is this. You consider, uh, so your manifold x. You consider domain there, say, omega. It has boundary y, d omega. And what you do, it is you take this. It's n-dimensional manifold. So you, you, you take volume of your y minus some measure of omega. And mu is some measure function, some measure on your manifold, which may be positive or negative. And in, in, in simple example, it's given by a de continuous density function, but not necessarily. Today, good example when it is not, when it's supported on, the measure supported on hypersurface itself. And I shall explain some of that today. And so this is a function. And in if this measure is just constant, right? So, so what, what are the solution of that? There will be hypersurfaces, mean curvature which of each point equal to that, to this measure. And they kind of very actually physicists call them kind of brains or something. Yeah? I, I saw some literature, they say brain schmain, something like that. There is no churn class here. It's volume minus measure, which churn class. 
It's a pure geometry. Here, no chunk lies here. Everything will be geometric. Chunk lies disappear right, in, the, in, in the story. The, the equation would be prescribed mean curvature? Uh, it will be, uh, stationary point will be prescribed mean curvature, but if they're minimizing, they will be stable. And there will be stability condition. And typical example, the model example they have in mind. So you see, the point is, usually people say, oh, take something, can, so surface of minimal area containing given volume. But that's inconvenient, because you, but what you say, huh, I, 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 not minimal given volume, but given integral. For example, can see the kind of concentric spheres. They're extremal for that, but what is the function mu? It exactly mean curvature of this, you see? In the same hyperbolic space, whatever, and they're extremal. It means that if you now have the same kind of geometry, but you change, you make scalar curvature more positive, and you look what happened there, you see that this operator, again, will have some positivity such that if you take now the, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm running a little bit ahead of myself. So, so again, you can use for positivity of some operator and to, 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 to reduce the, to kind, of, to kind of reduce dimension, but in a more in a more subtle way than we were doing before, which I now have to explain. So there are these two major extension of the minimal surface case, and what you can get with them. So let me give instances. So eventually, what you can obtain, kind of results, which follow, are. Yeah, no, I, I'm not, not ready to say because I haven't said thing before. Now, now I explain kind of some other scheme how we can use this second variation equation. So the second variation equation, if we have some manifold x and has some positive, say positive scalar curvature, but this applies to any scalar curvature, you have to kind of slightly change the formula. And you take this minimal subvariety, then the operator which is positive is this minus Laplace operator plus one half of the scalar curvature, right? So if you write down all this variation, some term disappears, this positive term, there are some other term in this, this, uh, this normal curvature of this manifold, and this equality exactly kind of like that, if this is a, a minimal surface, totally, it's kind of like totally geodesic here. It was actually, uh, so it's quite positive operator, lots of positivity, and the more singular, p p p p Surface the more positive this operator, but this point. And what you know about this operator, if you now, uh, so it's, you see it's one half is bigger than this one quarter, right? So if you, you, you have to use the full power of that, what you do, you take this manifold times a real line, with the metric here was dx squared plus, you have this uh, first eigenfunction, I keep forgetting maybe, uh, of this maybe squared times dt squared. So it takes some power uh, uh, of this. And then this will have positive scalar curvature. I, 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 might, I might be wrong about uh, whatever, whether it's squared or some, uh, something. There might be some other power, I think squared. So the point is that once this operator, we want to have a stable minimal subvariety, then you can construct here a, 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 a metric which, when you, when you project back, you have your old metric, and in this direction, it's invariant in the, in the action of R. So here you have ambient space of God knows what, and was minimum of variety. And now the ambient space becomes just product. Not exactly product, because this R may be sc sc scaled this or that way, right? But it's invariant under. Now we can repeat this process, like we did in Shenyao. But advantage is we now have a pretty good track of geometry. Right. It was not some conformal change. That what there you lose completely uh, what, what happening to the geometry of this manifold. Maybe I better call it y. Yeah? This was minimal of variety. Y, y embedded in x. X was complicated manifold inside minimal surface. Now this y inside become actually totally geodesic. And you have, you have the same picture, but now it's symmetric under R. Keep doing that. And when you keep doing that, you arrive just at full symmetry. If you have the dimension n, what you have, metric of positive scalar curvature, on, uh, uh, and invariant under translations. And, and that's kind of uh, ultimate thing, Im certainly impossible. And, 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 and all geometry of this 
y is still there. If y was big, and this would be big. You see, when you take conformal change, you lose control of the sign. And here, this manifold, of course, bigger than your y. You just, because you only sketch, you change it in one direction, but you don't change the y direction. And when you do that for manifolds with boundary, you immediately conclude, and this was where done sometime at Blaine, though it was a coarse argument that if you have manifold with boundary, it cannot be cannot be too large. What you do what argument was like that, take minimal so boundary here, construct minimal surface, which may go somewhere still the same picture applies. And you have symmetrization, but you shrink by fuck or a half, do it again, and then you have the very bad, bad exponential factor. So you just it was very, very in, an unprecise argument. However, this can be done sharp. Now, let me explain how this can be done without losing kind of any constants in a very a simple and transparent way, using the same kind of computation we had before there, but now. So what I want to prove is this kind of statement, that if I have manifold topologically torus cross interval such that scaly curvature, and, and this is a metric here, so it's a metric homeomorphic to it, and scaly curvature of x is greater or equal than scaly curvature of the sphere which is n, n minus 1. And here, boundary consists of two parts. So the boundary I call d plus and d minus. Corresponding, you know, I better start with minus and then plus. Distance between two ends. Then this distance is in, in this geometry x is less or equal, I hope I remember it correctly, to pi divided by n. And this sharp inequality. In dimension two, in dimension two you have just sphere, two dimension sphere, right? And distance here uh, is two, two pi over n, because I said two pi over n. Here is pi, so it's pi over n. Yeah. It must be, it, it must be, uh, ah, yeah, it's correct, correct. Yeah. N is two, yeah, yeah, perfect. N is 2, it cancels pi. Yeah, distance between two points is pi. So this is, this is an extremal object. So in high dimension, it will be no something of constant curvature. It will be of, of, of variable curvature. But this extremal object, which is not kind of the obvious one. Right? But this sharp inequality in all dimensions. And <coughs> when here, there is a torus. And so you don't use implicitly that there is no metric here. But, and then there is another kind of, more precise statement, which is combine now other things, but this more general one in the higher dimensions. So here again, there is a problem with singularities, and here you only need the Schön-Yau theorem, which is a kind of that more more inclined to trust. But the same statement is true. We have instead of torus, I take any manifold because kind of with two ends, and with the property that if I take any hypersurface here is admits the metric of positive scalar curvature. For example, it may be like this Kumma surface times interval. Which we don't admit. And then the same is true. So if scalar curvature of the ambient space is what I said, this distance will be like that. But here I need this log hump. In dimension for Kumma I don't need it because dimension is five. When dimension goes up, like if you have exotic sphere, of these Hitchin spheres which have numerical points of scalar curvature, I need uh, this theorem by La Hump, which is not exactly his theorem. I need generalization of his theorem. I'm sure it follows if his argument is right. No, if his logic is argument, it might, might be stable in some way. But because I don't know the proof, it's just conjecture. But I'm fairly certain if what he's written with his paper is okay, then it is okay. But, uh, but for, for, for Shen Yao, at least I, I can use the lemma from their paper which is, if correct, it applies uh, 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 literally. So how this proof goes? Let me again explain. And this again goes by, by symmetrization. So 
in, in, uh, for this case, I, instead of taking minimal surfaces here, hom 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 homology clustering has a cylinder, and I take this co-dimensional one surface, again based on the lower dimensional cylinder, and use the same logic of symmetrization. Right? Every time I have the minimal one, so I can multiply by a circle, and eventually I reduce the situation when this metric is invariant in the direction of the torus. It becomes one dimensional problem, and you solve it explicitly. And this was actually done already in our paper with Lawson. And you solve this um, metric with a tricky, this will be metric of the time, uh, dt squared plus some function phi squared d um, ds squared, uh, and it's also flat, but this is a tricky function, some integral, some tangents or something. But this kind of elementary, Riccati type equation, you solve it explicitly, and you uh, get this number. This is, uh, and, and, w and then if you look slightly more carefully at this argument, you don't have to be actually a torus. If you, what is actually true, yeah, well, and so, so what's amusing about that? So let's discuss this point. Already, that is quite, quite kind of, uh, has strange consequences. Namely, if I have n-dimensional sphere and I have torus there of, of co-dimension k, k either n minus one or n minus two, then it cannot have thick neighbor, say co-dimensional one, just to not, right? It cannot have big neighborhood around him because if you push it is, is aside, I cannot push them aside more than this distance because sphere has positive scalar curvature. I don't use the fact that it has positive sex, sectional curvature on the scalar. So you cannot have kind of wide theoretical band inside of the sphere. And because this property is invariant on the Lipschitz maps, the same is true for the ball. Inside of the ball, they can have this torus with a wide band. In particular, it must have big curvature. If it has small curvature, it can have wide band. And I, I, I don't see elementary proof of that. So a corollary, if I have a torus inside of here, its curvature must grow roughly like n. N-dimensional torus, co-dimensional one, since you can do it in ball. It's, it's, it's one of the principal curvatures must be of order n. For small dimension, but this is some constant, of course, yeah. But for, for large dimensions, become this asymptotics, and and the same a posteriori true if I have this immersed, actually embedded, don't exist, immersed exotic sphere of this kind. If it's very special sphere, and no, nothing you can say about other spheres, and it looks like it's absurd, as an elementary situation, Euclidean space, and you use all this kind of all, all this strange stuff, and you cannot kind of go through usual. You should make this argument inside immediately. Only scalar curvature being kept track of. Everything else just disappears. All this geometry becomes invisible. And so that's a very bizarre, and, and I don't know what happens to other example. If instead of torus, you take product of the spheres to the power, and I have no idea what happens. Of course, absolutely zero. No estimate at all. It may happen, you can do it with bounded curvature. So I don't know. If you take this S2 to the power n, and you want to put it into the space of dimension I know 2n plus 1. If you, in the ball here, in the new ball, if you can do it with bounded curvature, regardless of dimension. Of course, the obvious, the obvious kind of thing, kind of, it's, it's, it's uh, curvature grows pretty, pretty fast, but, but for, for obvious embedding, yeah? But it's very unclear in codimension, but in codimension, in codimension one, yeah, this it's actually there is no obvious simple embedding. Simple obvious embedding have in the middle dimension, and then it, it grows like square root in examples. But we can, you know, but you and then you cannot do better than square root in any dimension. So it's completely, completely strange situation. So, if, so, so again, so the question is: I have this s two to the power n. I embed it to the ball of, of unit ball. What kind of the minimal sectional curvature can achieve? And the best embedding I have on n goes to infinity is like square root of n. And, uh, what, uh, and, and then if follow co-dimension, you can construct some rather artificial embedding slightly um, also curved. And they, in co-dimension one, will be more curved more than n, actually. They will be like n to some power. But this is very strange. And only scalar curvature tells you what happens for, 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 for all, for all non-trivial kind of examples. Very, very, very. Uh, Strange situation, and I think it's quite interesting. I mean, exactly that that you realize how poorly you understand things. 
this is really makes you make you happy. The, well, of course, at the beginning, then we keep a non understanding, you're not so happy. Right? So that's so, so, so what happens here. And uh, And then there is a, and how this goes along with, so it, at which moment you need this, this function, what they call mu bubbles. So what they're good for. So what you can prove is that they use. Yeah. And uh, this is exactly what I said, that if I have, again, this kind of picture, manifold with two ends, and you know no hypersurface here has metric with positive, uh, positive scaly curvature, then then, uh, uh, the reason, uh, then the distance might be one what I said. So what you do, you construct a, a function. So you have this model example. I said there is extreme metric, and then there is family of hypersurfaces. And uh, they have certain mean curvature, right? And so on the shrink, of course, this mean curvature uh, from, from our side because very kind of very, very negative. But then you just you take this function mu and just s s solve this variational problem with this function mu, right? And <coughs> if the distance was a little bit so, so a little bit bigger, you could the function go a little bit slower. And therefore, uh, here these two things, this, the, you can solve this problem because uh, by maximum principle, the solution cannot hit either of the two boundaries. So they is used to, as a barriers for this problem. So if distance was big enough, and you, 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 you slightly it make, you could make this mu move slightly slower from this value to this value, right? Because mu kind of becomes first positive, then become negative. When you go in, in this direction, right? Mean curvature depends on the sign. You go in this direction, first positive, positive, then become negative, negative, right? right? Like on, 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 the, on the sphere. From this point of view, it was growing, growing, so it's positive, and then things become negative. So we can solve that. And <coughs> you can show that if you look this this thing and look what happens to a second variation equation, it, it tells you exactly that it is, that the, again, this operator, 1 plus 1 half la minus Laplace in scalar curvature is positive. And therefore, there is conformal change. You don't have to do anything. It has positive scalar curvature. So but my assumption was there isn't such manifold. Therefore, the distance must be like that. But here, you see, because I, I, I need to just, not just kind of intermediate step, I need exactly this submanifold to, 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 to be there. And I need log hump, log hump theorem for that purpose, which is, he says it slightly differently. But it, I think it's, it, it's almost formally folded from what he says, but he's saying it's so. And specifically, it's, 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 it's so. And, <coughs> and then, so what follows from this, for example, no, this probably still wouldn't follow. Yeah. There were some other things which you need more, 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 more to say. Let me give another kind of corollary of this argument, which is, I think, I'm using because it's kind of the topology completely hidden there, right? And which is almost sharp, and it is as following. But imagine I have a cube with or dimension n, and doesn't have, of course, actually a cube, but anything kind of cubically shaped. And it, it also comes with a metric of positive scalar given metric of positive scalar curvature. I want to give another b b b uh, way how to bound the, the, the size. All right. <coughs> 
This, by the way, all can be used to bound the size, but they're not very sharp. And this is almost sharp. And scaling, again, of this greater than n, n minus 1. And then there are the following functions here. It is, you have distances, you have opposite faces. On cube, there are kind of n pairs of opposite faces. And there are these distances. And then the statement is that maximal distance of that is greater or equal than 1 over square root of n. I don't remember the constant. Some numbers say put in the 2. But I know this, this. It's not sharp. It's sharp up to fact of pi over 2 or something. So inequality which I have is not sharp <coughs> for, the, the, for dimension 2. For dimension 2, you know the extreme of, uh, distance might be pi. Which, by the way, maybe just exercise for you. You have a square and metric of positive scalar curvature bigger than for the sphere. Then at least two pairs must be within distance, uh, no more than, no, or I said maximum, I said minimum. I'm sorry. Of course, in one direction may become very big, but some must be small. These are actually relations between all of them, which I am <coughs> afraid to write. To write. But in, in, in dimension two, the sharp inequality is pi. But in general, and, and this square root is, is kind of close to optimal. You see, you cannot do it better. And the e example is we take a ball in this sphere, and, 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 and this sphere you take a cube. And this becomes your cube. So divide it as a cube, and then and here distance will be about square root or, or size of, of the cube. So, and, and, but this is not uh, optimal situation. You can write more slightly better. But even up to a constant, the universal constant, they are the same. And so what I'm using here, topology disappeared here. But it's secretly there, because tube, in a way, related to the torus. But then this gives you a kind of very transparent thing, that why, why <coughs> you cannot have a big thing, yeah? If you, have, you can have a very big cube, and this is almost sharp inequality. And uh, probably, well, is, th th there is a reason to, well, there is a kind of argument principle of maybe you can eliminate this constant. But that's a minor, minor issue. And now, the last, I, I, I'll start here, but we'll not finish. How we can use kind of both of them and how you can use in a more kind of amusing way a direct oper operator argument for, kind of for, for geometric purposes. So as far as topology is concerned, it seems to me that everything obtained is direct operator can be superseded by uh, supersided. I'm not sure how to say it in English. Yeah? I see this written but never spoken by minimal surface arguments and in the noise of conjecture by, by kind of a rather elementary uh, topological argument. But when it comes to geometry, then there is something. And uh, in one of the instances of that is the following statement which concerns scale, uh, mean curvature. And this is as follows. That if I have now a manifold, and again, it's scalar curvature and dimensional manifold x, and the bo this boundary y, now this boundary, and again, scalar curvature of x greater or equal than the of a sphere. And assume that mean curvature of this y is greater than curvature of the sphere. Okay. Where what I say is quite, you'll be already, at least I don't know, the independent proof, even though I assume this. Ah, no, no, I'm sorry. Here I want to say zero. I can say it for the sphere, but prefer to zero. Just point your scalar curvature, even when curvature is zero. For example, maybe just hypersurface in the Euclidean space with positive mean curvature, with mean curvature greater than that. Then this y, if I map this y to the sphere of dimension n minus 1, such that it is smooth distance decreasing map, then either it's contractible or it's isometry. I say smooth. If it's not smooth, actually, I cannot prove it. It's kind of funny. If I just say ellipsis, this is decreasing. I don't have to say it's smooth. And, uh, and, and then it's, 
I, I don't know how to prove it. So it's either it's contractible or it's asymmetry. And of course, when asymmetry is just usual sphere, right? There is nothing can be there. And uh, <coughs> for that, you need you need a rather, rather sophisticated level of computationally. You use the same kind of mathematics, but you use a, a Dirac theorem, but apply to some twisted bundles where you have to compute curvatures rather carefully, right? So, so, so let me say something about that. And then, and, and this is a careful thing, we can be combined, can be combined, <coughs> and to prove And this will I'll, I'll prove next time. So it's, it's it's one thing. Another is that if you have a n-dimensional sphere with one or with two punctures, but the punctures might be opposite. Okay. With this metric, then you cannot enlarge the metric without making scalar curvature somewhere smaller. And it's one or two points, and two points opposite. If we slightly change it, I don't know what happens. Actually, I even don't know what happens very well for, for dimension two. Yeah. And this uses combination of, of, of both Dirac operator and minimal surface argument. And this is kind of sharp results, and particularly it says that any manifold with a boundary, forget about the second point, yeah? Can be big if scalar curve, which is big, because you know, otherwise it will be contained, it will be cover the sphere easily, yeah, just shrink. Right? Because you see that may blow open up this point. If manifold is complete, it's, rather, it's more much easier to show, but then it's not so interesting. And this is also sharp. So if equality only, if this is a situation, is like that. And if you throw away any other subset, I have no idea. Well, I don't know whether it's true or not. For three, for if you take the two points which are like that, I really don't know what happens. Even for two sphere, I'm confused. If you can enlarge the metric. For two sphere, of course, there are some cases when you, if you think a little bit, there are obvious arguments. And if they work, it's work. If they don't work, they don't work. And then you don't know what to do. So, so what is the, what goes into that? Yeah, I already said about this <coughs> minimal surface. And, and kind of the last ingredient, uh, when, when geometry comes, is as follows. So I was talking about manifolds mapped to the sphere, and they take pull back. Some bundle on the sphere, it comes here, and you take the cooperative with twisted bundle. And the flatter the bundle, the better geometric constraint you have of the map, right? So you want to show that the map of non zero degree, non contractible map, <coughs> will be incompatible with large scalar curvature. And the, the better, the smaller curvature of the bundle you can f f find with non, non, non zero kind of churn, churn class, the better. What is the optimal bundle on the sphere? Right? Of course, with S2, it's a Hopf bundle. Right, the square root of the of the tangent bundle, so it's better curvature by by twice as much. What corresponds to the Hopf bundle to high dimensional sphere of dimension even dimensional? But odd dimensional, by the way, might be slightly tricky. Uh, you, you can do it also odd dimensional, but then you have to be it's somewhat artificial. So, what is the optimal bundle over n-dimensional sphere, which corresponds to the which corresponds to the Hopf bundle? Because, and I remember that uh, because we were doing this with Blaine, and just uh, this question arise, and oh, of course, it's okay, obvious for him, this obvious bundle. If you know a little bit of topology, you know what the obvious bundle. It's spin plus bundle. You take the bundle of positive spins. And this bundle has a minimal possible curvature among all bundles. This and if you take any manifold, <coughs> spin manifold, and map it to the sphere, and take this spherical plus bundle and pull it back, then the index of twisted Dirac operator is non-zero, if the map has non-zero degree. Because you see, for the sphere itself, if you take Dirac operator twisted with this bundle, it's what will be the index? For me, it's one half, but it's every characteristic of the manifold. And it's true for any manifold. You take any manifold, Say with zero signature, the signature, we don't, signature also enter in the formula. And you take Dirac operated twisted with this very bundle and this manifold. And then the, by index theorem, you get early characteristic. 
what essential for us if every characteristic non zero, this is non zero. I forgot maybe there is some coefficient in the characteristic. And, and this ha bundle has the minimal curvature and it's optimal. So if you take any other manifold and map it to the sphere and the map is contracting, then <coughs> this bundle has smaller curvature than here and therefore Dirac operator with coefficient with one will be positive. This requires some computation. There is no proof without kind of, kind of morally obvious, but it requires some computation. And what is, and moreover, <coughs> and this for some situation essential. It's not necessarily distance decreasing map. It's enough area decreasing map because curvature lives in, in two dimensions. And so it may, it may expand in some direction, but then be compensated by con contraction with other directions. And so that the theorem was proven by LaRule, so he, he, he made this computation for this bundle, and it says if you have a spin manifold and you map it to the sphere, and its scalar curvature is n minus 1 greater than that, and the map is non, non, non zero degree, it's either contractible or isometric. If it's area contracts, you must be careful for, for G GHG case. It's still, so there are some tricky points. And then the, the last, what I want to say today, and then I will be using it, we'll be using it la next time. For it's, it's kind of crucial for geometric applications. That the same is true if it is not surface, but any convex hypersurface in Euclidean space. So if you have a map, which is distance decreasing, and, and at every point, scalar curvature here, bigger than scalar curvature here, that map either contractible or asymmetric. So in this respect, uh, this was proven by two people, I think, Gert and Zimmerman or something, uh, about five, six years ago, seven years ago, no, more than that, I think, but, but now, no, it's a little more, probably 15 years ago, that this is true, for, they proved for actually for any manifold which have Positive curvature operator. Hmm? Yes, of course. It's, it, a dimension must have non-zero degree. And either it has, if, if it has non-zero degree, you pull back the same, the same bundle and make the same computation, and then you, yes, it's enough to have positive curvature operator, which is kind of remarkable for applications. It, it has a quite, quite interesting application, exactly for convex hypersurfaces. Uh, uh, for, 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 for spheres. And uh, even for very simple kind of convex, like for spheric and symmetric hypersurface, you think what's happening in there, because here is a flat part and here, there, and it's some, for example, from this theorem, I think even from the, yeah, from the, this theorem, you can already have at least some form of the positive mass theorem, which kind of follows you know, rather trivially. Because you have very remarkable, beautiful possibility here, you can change this convex hypersurface and you have different geometric results when I would take. In particular, the last corollary I want to say uh, of the theorem which I will be discussing last time is that if I have a convex polyhedron in the Euclidean space where all the hedral angles less or equal than 2 pi, uh, I'm sorry, pi over 2. Of course, there are not too many of them. The simplices and cubes and product of simplices, and that's it. But still, then you, you cannot deform it in such a way that you cannot simultaneously make curvature, curvatures of boundaries more positive, mean curvatures are more positive, scalar curvature inside more positive, and all the hidden angles going down. And again, even if you forget, even if you forget about scalar curvature, it is still not, not obvious. Even for flat deformation, it's not fully obvious. Yeah. Actually, I, don't, I, I haven't thought, no, for flat, the, the proof which I, I have, you, you kind of, you, you prove it on, on the way. And uh, this condition is, it's unclear how essential this condition. And uh, there are situations when you know it is unneeded and probably it's, Never need it, and just mm, I communicated with uh, with Karim and Auntie uh, 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 who comes here, and uh, he's kind of expert on these angles, and he said that for small deformation of 
manipulate polyhedron, you can prove it using cryo sophisticated Hodge theory. It's also by different kind of mathematics. And here, what you prove, you prove by Dirac operator. And so there may be kind of quite interesting link here. They kind of come together, these two different mathematical elliptic theories. So, uh, so there are definite instances when it's proven for, for, for example, if we have a kind of n gone here, in this kind of a prism, it's OK. And then it was proven by Chao Li recently for certain simplices, but I am not certain again, 100% certain, he, 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 you know, he sometimes he assumed this condition, sometimes not. But his uh, argument by, by minimal surfaces, and this is fully by, by Dirac operator. So, and so that, that's how things can be, can be, can be combined. So here, you, no, here you don't use minimal, you can, they enter both, but they difference anyway. But in some, some, some way, you, so sometimes you can combine them. Right, because the, the basis of this combination, as I said, this property that if you know that this section has no positive scalar curvature, then you have some distance here, and this sometimes you can prove the only way to prove it is using using Dirac operator. So, so this, of course, there is no chance of proving something like Lichnerovich theorem or Hitchin theorem by minimum surfaces, right? Because they're completely oblivious of, of smooth structures. Or maybe I'm wrong here. Yeah. But, uh, but for all we know, there is no, no hope to see it geometrically, if, if whatever you call geometry. So, so what is our objective? I, I just, what, what I stated, there is various inequalities, and some of them sharp, and I want to prove them. And if there is time, I shall discuss stability. So how stable this inequality, and uh, <coughs> in relativity, again, this basic stability property is pro proven relatively recently is uh, this Penrose conjecture saying that um, this Schwarzl time, Schwarzl space, uh, not time, sh spatial part of sh Schwarzl geometry is have some stability, slightly perturbed, you cannot change much shape if you slightly perturb the, the metric. Because this, this, the subtle point you have to keep in mind, we have subjects like this positive scalar curvature or curvature greater sigma, greater uh, scalar curvature, greater than any number po positive or negative sigma, or, or you always can say make this bubble. Uh, big bubble, any kind of positive scalar curvature greater than one, and in only at this moment it becomes slightly better than the sigma. On this tiny little neck, they will, it will become sigma minus epsilon, right? And uh, and picture will be that, and, and then become again positive, become positive. So nothing can be stable in the naive sense. If you perturb something, you immediately have these extra bubbles. But the point is, they cut. You can cut them by narrow necks. And how narrow this necks, it's tricky. There is a sharp result only available for the, for this uh, understanding of the Penrose uh, situation when there is sharp estimate and the extreme of th extreme object is the Schwarzschild metric. But in general, <coughs> this, you can prove that there are some kind of partial results in this direction. So certainly exactly saying, saying uh, uh, what, what, what I, I said, that there is this possibility of instability is kind of very limited, but this kind of has interesting, of course, interpretation, like physical interpretation. We have kind of, kind of universe may bubble by s little, very small modification of geometry here, lack of positivity, and things bubbles. And again, also, <coughs> the interesting idea you have if you multiply in general geometric by scalar curvature, and when scalar curvature is positive, it's remains the metric, and it's a nice metric. When it's negative, it's kind of negative world. It's negative energy. And, it, and they can play one against another. And how they play? Partly, it's uh, encoded by this uh, conformal Laplace operator, but not fully. And there are <coughs> quite, quite interesting relations between positive and negative part. They can balance, but not in a, any simple way. And sometimes, they, they reflect it in something simple, but it was, but well, when it comes to the boundary effects, yeah, like in positive mass conjecture, but you must, uh, but well, this I must admit I don't quite, I'd, I'll tell what results are there, but which I have not quite uh, understood. Okay, so that's for today. <coughs> so it's a question now, yeah, yeah, I keep this, yeah, and you ask question, and it's going to be recorded. So it must be a really good question, yeah, because it's on the recorded. <laughs> so. Maxim, you, you, you must have a question. No voice. <laughs> no voice. Question, but no voice. Everything was clear. Fantastic. <laughs>
So you see, this, there is an interaction of this method, and none of them is because it's perfect. And eventually, of course, you, know, you have to uh, either or both completely change concept of scalar curvature or invent different kind of mathematical formalism, and then scalar curvature become redundant, become kind of trivial matter. It will be just on the side of the issue. But we don't know, of course, what this method is. Right? Right, so, so we have to bring together uh, these variational techniques with minimal surfaces and their kind of basic formulas, of course. And uh, well, there are some speculations what kind of object is, how we can generalize, for example, minimal surface equation. Right? And there is a kind of interesting, and you go very, very far from it. But, well, it's, um, and uh, this is in spirit close to quantization, but not quite, which I don't know what quantization is, but it's kind of the same flavor. And the same, of course, for, for Dirac operator, which is more common, how you quantize it, or it's linear. And then we can meet somewhere. OK, but if you don't have questions, I'll finish. We have questions, no? Pierre? No? You're not sure? Oh. So I'm going to prove possible theorems using the techniques. What? Making a positive mass theorem using these techniques? Or? No, no, I, there are two proofs. Uh, so one point is that at some moment it was shown by Lockham that positive mass theorem, this perturbation which preserves energy of, of, of certain sign, equivalent, I mean, reducible by simple linear kind of analysis to the case when perturbations are constant at infinity, we have flat infinity. Right. Prior to that, there were this partial reduction, and then it's used by Shen Yao by minimal surfaces, and with no reduction, direct argument by Witten. And the Witten argument, you construct certain Dirac operator, harmonic Dirac operator, and if you look at this formula, Bochner, Lichnerovic's formula, Schrodinger at infinity, its boundary term exactly becomes what, what uh, considered to be mass. And so it becomes quite, except you have to work out this analysis. And this was generalized by, by, by various people. But on the other hand, the moment you reduce it, to this uh, flat infinity, you can compactify it to the torus, and then any proof applies. On, and uh, it's one argument. And, and there are many arguments of them. And in particular, using these sharp estimates of, of, of Goethe and Zimmermann, you can give yet another proof. And actually, what you prove with, the, with, with them is a better result, in a way. The, it, it proves you something you cannot prove by other methods. So this, for the moment, looks the most powerful kind of general method. Uh, it's, but it, it depends on rather, well, for somebody it's easy. It's half a page computation. For me, it's horrible. You, with positive curvature operator, you just play a little bit. Diagonalize this operator, this operator. That is not nothing kind of outworldly, pure algebra. But uh, it's very remarkable that it works. Right. And it gives you, and uh, it's here it's everywhere. It's some algebra, it's some moment interferes and give you this result. And this algebra is there is no kind of systematic understanding of this. So, my, I think that if you understand this algebra and develop it fully, and then you find some analytical geometric implementation of that. But they kind of, and, but there is, of course, no such theory for the moment. But this is what you would like from point of view of methods, but from point of view of results. You, of course, well, there are still cases when you, you, there are obvious conjectures you can prove, yeah?